Well, I welcome you this uh, January morning, and I welcome those that are joining us on YouTube, on Uncharted Online. We're delighted to have all of you with us. We are studying together the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, and last week we found ourselves in Matthew chapter 17, and we talked about the the transfiguration of Christ. It's a beautiful story, a powerful story that touched the lives of John and Peter so much that uh, years later they would recite the story. John in uh, the first chapter of the Gospel of John and Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1 and they would both speak to it uh, just, just you can't imagine, You're, right? If, if, if that happened to you and you were with Jesus and all of a sudden his glory wasn't veiled and his glory shined through even his clothes and his face and his skin, you would never forget that day. And so they wrote about it as a confirmation that Jesus is truly the Son of God. And we talked about the fact that this is, only, this, this is only a story of Jesus, that Buddha was never transfigured. Muhammad was never transfigured. This is, this is uh, singular of Jesus. And, and I, uh, I uh, just let me say this. I promised my wife this morning that I would neither speak of her name or my glory in this Bible study. So, uh, um, so we'll, try to, we'll try to be a little more, we'll try not to cross boundaries today like we did last week. Um, now, the story of the transfiguration of Jesus stands in sharp contrast to the story that immediately follows it. Now, I know we're studying the book of Matthew, um, but uh, this story appears in Matthew and Mark and Luke, and I want us to read Mark's version of it this morning. So will you join me in Mark chapter 9? Uh, I've said this before, so many of you know this. Uh, John Mark is the writer of the Gospel of Mark. He's the same John Mark that Barnabas and Paul had a little spat about on their second missionary journey. Barnabas wanted to take John Mark, but John Mark had quit on the first missionary journey. He had quit them and gone back, and so Paul was like, I'm taking John Mark. He's a quitter. Uh, and they had such a, such a dispute that Barnabas took John Mark and he went to Cyprus and then Paul picked up Silas. And so what God did was he actually doubled the missionary effort and later um, Paul would write in his letters, he would say, and uh, bring John Mark because he's really, really good for the gospel. And so there would be a, a total healing of that. John Mark would mostly... Uh, hang out with Peter at the end of Peter's life. Not as much Paul, but Peter. And uh, John, Mark was, uh, John Mark was probably, in my estimation, the rich young ruler. So when you read the story of the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and he goes away sorrowful because Jesus says, go and give away all your money and come follow me. And he, he goes away and he's sad because he had a lot of money. So that's not the end of his story. Um, and, and by the way, don't give up on those that you're sharing Christ with either. It's not the end. The average person rejects the gospel seven times before they accept the gospel. So don't give up on your one. Uh, John Mark wasn't given up on. He's saved. But John Mark, is, uh, he's educated. Peter is a regular guy. He's a fisherman. He's just a blue-collar guy. So most of Peter's writings are dictated, and John Mark writes them. And so the Gospel of Mark has Mark's name, but it's really, in many ways, the Gospel of Peter. It's Peter's insights. He's the one that's been telling to Mark, this happened, and this happened, and this happened. So we know then, we've got another view here of, of what uh, Peter, how Peter s saw this whole thing. So I want us to look at the story about what happens when Jesus comes down down from the Mount of Transfiguration, and then we're going to compare these because they, they stand in an in incredible contrast uh, one to another. Have you got Mark chapter 9 open? Find verse 14. Uh, this is the same story. He's been on the Mount, Transfiguration. Uh, Elijah and uh, Moses are gone. Uh, Jesus' glory is now veiled. He looks like he always does. He's no longer glowing. They come down off the mountain. Verse 14. 
And when they came to the disciples, this is the other eight. He had with him Peter, James, and John. Now they've come down to the other eight. And it's not just the disciples, but there's a great crowd around them. So they came to the disciples. They saw a great crowd around them. And the scribes are arguing with them. So this is, it's, it's a mob. We've been seeing mobs on television these days. It's a mob of people. And they're, they're, they're bickering and fighting and hollering at each other. This is very different from the, the beauty of the glory of the only begotten of the Father and the tranquility of the mountain. The, we truly, there, this is, by the way, this is the chapter where in, in Christian life we talk about a mountaintop experience. Have you ever heard that? Christians use that phrase. It comes from this story right here. So the mountaintop is the voice of the Father it is the glory of God, and now at the bottom of the mountain, it's a great crowd, and they are arguing, the scribes and his disciples, verse 15, and immediately all the crowd, when they saw Jesus, were greatly amazed, because now he just shows up, and they ran up to him, and they greeted him, and he asked them, what are you, what are you arguing about? Because everybody's got an opinion, everybody's shouting at each other. Someone from the crowd, and so not even one of the eight disciples, answered him and said, Teacher, I brought my son to you. Or he, it wasn't, he hasn't seen Jesus yet, but he was going to bring him to you. He's got a spirit that makes him mute. So this is a demonic spirit. This is a boy that is possessed by a demon, and he can't speak. In verse 18, he goes on to say, And whenever this demon possesses him, it seizes him, it throws him down, he foams, he grinds his teeth, he becomes rigid. Sounds like a, sounds like a, a epileptic seizure or something like that, but there's more to it because it's got the demon with it. He says, so I, you weren't here, so I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able to do it. Now, I'll just stop here just for a second. Um, the, the disciples have been able to do this before this. Uh, there was a time when Jesus took the 12 and he sent them out and he sent them out to preach and they went out on their own. He needed that, by the way, he needed the time alone. He went away alone. They came back. The scripture says they came back rejoicing and said, we, we heal people and we cast out demons and it was really awesome. And Jesus said, boy, he said, I was there when when Satan was thrown out of heaven. And he just rejoices with them. So this is not new to them. They've done this, but for, for reasons that we're going to read here, on this occasion, no power. They can't do it. And so he says, uh, I asked them and they were not able. Verse 19, this is a very, very harsh rebuke from Jesus to the eight, because remember, they, they have done this before. He says, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? So he's, uh, he is aggravated. Uh, did, you, did you know that Jesus got aggravated? Um, Jesus gets sad. The scripture says he gets angry. Um, the, the scripture says he gets uh, tired. He's sleepy. The scripture says he's hungry. Jesus was in every single way human. Don't ever forget that. If, it were, if he was not fully human then his sacrifice wouldn't have counted. He wouldn't have represented all of mankind. He was completely human. And, and so here he's, he's annoyed with them. And he says, and again, this seems kind of terse here. He's speaking to them. And imagine what he's just experienced. He's just heard the voice of the Father. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. He's just talked to Elijah and Moses. He's been transfigured. He's, he's been up in the presence of the heavenly father and the bottom of the mountain is different. And so kind of, kind of terse, bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the demon, when the spirit sees Jesus, he immediately convulsed the boy and he fell on the ground. He rolled about, he's foaming at the mouth and it's interesting, Jesus doesn't yet deal with the demon, but he asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, e ever since he was a kid, from childhood. And it's often cast him into the fire, and it's cast him into the water to try to kill him and destroy him. And then the man says, but if, and you can imagine, can you imagine just being this father? 
He says, if you can, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us. And Jesus still just a little miffed, okay? And he, he says to him, if, <laughs> if you can, and that's really the problem at the bottom of the mountain. The problem at the bottom of the mountain is it's all ifs, buts, and maybes. The problem at the bottom of the mountain is nobody's seen the glory of God. Nobody is certain of the power of God. The bottom of the mountain is arguments, and uh, this is my point of view, and this is my point of view, and, and uh, back and forth. And this guy, he's come, he's brought his son, his son's possessed with a demon, and he just says, if you can do anything, have compassion on us. And Jesus says, if you can. And now Jesus turns, and he's, he's always the consummate teacher. He's always the teacher. And he says, all things are possible for the one who believes. He's, he's literally now settling the arguments that have been taking place at the bottom of the mountain. And so he says, all things are possible for the one who believes. And I out of everything that I ever read in Scripture, I identify with this next phrase maybe more than any other verse in Scripture. I, I, I know what it's like to be a dad. I know what it's like to be a grandfather. I know what it's like to want my, the best for my children. I know when they're suffering how much I hate that. I know the times I've prayed and asked God to move in their lives. And Jesus has been a little tough with him, if you can, to the one who believes all things are possible. Listen to this response, verse 24. Immediately, the father of the child cried out, I believe, help my unbelief. Which one is it? Yes, it's both. Have you, have you ever not been there? Have you ever, you believed, but you didn't? You wanted to believe, but you couldn't? You decided you believed, but you didn't know. This is the human experience. This father speaks for all of us. I, yeah, I want to believe. Help my unbelief. Did you know that Jesus does that, by the way? The scripture says in Galatians 2.20 that we are crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, we live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of of the Son of God who gave himself for me. The verse does not say that you live by your own faith. You live by the faith that God gives you. Isn't it good to know that you don't have to have the faith that you actually can't conjure up on your own? That God even gives you the faith that you need so that you can place your faith in him. And this is this story. God takes compassion. Jesus just loves this guy and he responds to him. And there's never a more honest response than this in the Bible. Lord, I believe to help my unbelief. And so the scripture says here that when Jesus saw the crowd, they were starting to come running together and he didn't really want the crowd. He just wanted this dad. He just wanted his son. So now he's starting to get the crowd. So now he kind of hastens up and he says, you mute, you mute deaf spirit. So now we discover he was not only mute, but he was deaf and epileptic and, the, and, the, and the, then the demons there as well. I command you to come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, the demon came out and the boy, he's like, he was like he was dead. He's like a corpse. And so many of the people said, he's dead. And again, Imagine the moment of the people who really don't believe. They, they're watching it, but they don't believe. And somebody at the back of the crowd is like, Jesus killed him. He's dead. And of course, he's not dead. And uh, verse 27, Jesus took him by the hand and he lifted him up. You read that beautiful phrase in Scripture over and over again. He does it with the girl who is actually dead. Uh, and he, everybody laughs because he says, she's not dead, she's asleep. And they were already getting ready for the funeral. He takes her by the hand and he lifts her up. The lame man takes him by the hand, lifts him up. This is a beautiful phrase. What does he do in your life? 
He takes you by the hand and he lifts you up. How many times have you fallen? How many times have you sinned? How many times have you stubbed your spiritual toe? How many times have you messed up? He takes you by the hand and he lifts you up. Even though your sin is great, his mercy is greater. He takes you by the hand and he lifts you up. And he does that here again with this boy. And he arose and when he had entered, so the boy arises, the end of the story is him now, the crowd's gone, and he's back with the eight. He's got the 12, but the eight are going to ask him. Verse 28, when he entered the house, the disciples said to him privately, how come we couldn't do that? Now remember, they've done it before. So how come we couldn't cast him out? And he says, uh, he says and to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. And some, some Bibles say prayer and fasting. And uh, some of you, different translations, there's a little bit of addition there. So, so Jesus is now coming back to them, and he's, he's really just speaking to their prayerlessness. The idea that you don't walk with Jesus, and you don't spend any time with Jesus, and you don't pray to Jesus, but then you just at the, any moment just going to do a miracle is foreign to this concept. Biblically, you 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 got to walk with Jesus to have the power of Jesus in your life. So let's stop and just, first of all, just think about the contrast, shall we? Because the, the we, we've split the stories up, but if you were just to read this seamlessly, the stories are together. Jesus is on the mountain, and on the mountain is just seven of them. There's Peter, James, and John, Jesus... Elijah and Moses and the God the Father. And on the mountain, it's the glory of God. And on the mountain, it's the voice of God. And on the mountain, there is no uncertainty. There's no lack of faith. On the mountain, we, we see the, the totality of the covenant of the Father in Moses and Elijah, meeting now with Jesus, the new covenant, a new way to heaven, the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God. On the, on the mountain, the, the three fall down and worship. And even though Peter says things, he really doesn't know what he's saying, they still fall down and worship. When they're coming down from the mountain, they're asking Jesus, when are you going to come back, and how does this happen, and what does it mean that John the Baptist come first? And I kind of skipped over that, but they're having this wonderful time with Jesus where he says to them, he says, Elijah did already come. He came in the John the Baptist. It was the spirit of Elijah. And so he explains all of that, and it's just, a, it's just a marvelous time where these three men are alone with Jesus. Even the the end of the story of the transfiguration, they're down on the ground in worship, and when they look up, the scripture says, and they only see Jesus. Those are great moments. I've had those moments at Clydehurst. I've had those moments at a Christian camp. I've had those moments myself hunting in the mountains where I'm just looking at the creation of God. I've had those moments with my Bible in front of my fireplace at home. I've had those moments with you where God speaks and he does something great in our midst. Great holy, sacred, divine moments, and they are precious. And they're precious, I think, partly because they are few. Because most of life takes place at the bottom of the mountain. The bottom of the mountain are people and lots of people who all have different ideas about uh, epilepsy and demon possession and the scribes and the Pharisees and the disciples. And the disciples are down there and they want to make a stand for Christ and they've done this before. And now they say, demon, be gone. And he doesn't go anywhere. Maybe he even laughs at them. There's a very funny story in the book of Acts. It's funny to me, okay? This, will, this probably gives away more about myself than I should. But uh, the story is that there are uh, seven sons of Sceva, and uh, he's a high priest, and they heard that the apostle Paul is casting out demons. And so they decide they want some of the notoriety that the apostle Paul has. They, they want to be known like him. And so they find this guy somehow who's demon-possessed and uh, seven brothers, seven sons, they, they go in there and they, they do their whatever they do, their incantations, their exorcisms, they, they shout at the demon this. And, the, and so they, they've gone in the house and the, the way the story is told, I, I think of it like watching a movie in my mind's eye. The demon-possessed guy is inside the house. They go inside the house. We're all outside the house watching. We can hear. 
We can hear what's going on. And then in a little bit we hear, we hear furniture moving around and slapped and broken and we hear cries and whelps. And so the guy who's demon-possessed, you can read this in Acts, I'm not making it up, the guy who's demon-possessed beats them all up. He beats up the seven guys and for spite, for fun, he strips them so they all come running out of the house naked. See, I ended up talking too much again, didn't I? It's a Bible story. So I just think that's funny. And in the story, by the way, the seven go, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, this is how they're going to get the demon to come out. In the name of Jesus, that's right, whom Paul preaches, that's right, come out. And the demon says, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? There's a moral to that story in there. You don't need to go around thinking you're something you're not. And these disciples who had had success before now had obviously started thinking, well, it's me. I've got the power. I've got the power, right? But the power doesn't come from them. Power comes from Jesus. And if you're not walking with Jesus and you're not spending time with Jesus, and you're not communing with Jesus, you don't have the blessing of Jesus. You don't have the power of Jesus. And so the bottom is turmoil and mobs and arguing, and it's powerlessness. The shame of many churches that will meet this Sunday is they meet, they sing some songs, somebody will open up the scripture but there's no power. It's a little bit like they're talking about the Jesus that they've heard about and the Apostle Paul that they've heard about, but nobody knows Jesus personally. He hasn't changed their lives. They're not walking with him. And so this is the bottom of the mountain. And the bottom of the mountain, Jesus says, he says, you're a faithless generation. How long do I have to be with you? How long do I have to tell you how this happens? And then the guy comes. So there's, there's really, there's, there's three groups of people at the bottom of the mountain. The first group are the disciples. The disciples represent believers who are not walking in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. So they're believers. These, these, guys, are not, these guys are not people who would say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. They believe. They have given up their jobs and their vocations and the, their families to walk with Jesus. And, they, and they've been, they're going to walk with Jesus for three and a half years. These guys are going to become the apostles of the church and change the world beginning in Acts chapter 2. They are believers. But at this point in time, they are not spirit-filled believers. I, I would rather have a brand new baby spirit-filled believer than a believer who's known the Lord for 50 years and is not spirit-filled. It does, you don't gain, you're, nothing is gained by saying, I'd walk with the Lord 50 years if 45 of those have been lifeless. You, you want to experience the power of God, the presence of God, the work of God. You want to know that God speaks to you. And so really, and we could, I think metaphorically, we could say the problem for these guys is they hadn't been on the mountaintop. They hadn't been with God the Father. They hadn't seen Jesus in his glory. They had lost sight of all of that. They're just down at the bottom. And I, I see this in my fellow pastors I uh, love and I talk to, and I talk to pastors every week. And recently, so many of them are saying to me, I'm so tired. I'm so tired. I, uh, COVID's really changed church life, and people had to make decisions, and they're just, they're just beat. They're just worn out. And the thing is, you can... You can do God's work every day without God's power. And without God's power, if you do God's work in your own strength, I'm here to tell you by my own experience and God's word, you will get tired. And then the next thing will happen is Satan's going to come and trip you up. And just because you're a pastor or minister doesn't mean you can't commit an immorality or something that would cause you to lose your calling. Satan comes for all of us. And sometimes we just are doing the work of God, but we're just going through the motions. There's no power of God. So these guys are not Holy Spirit 
filled people. And I really don't have time to teach all of the filling of the Holy Spirit, but um, Colossians, Galatians, Ephesians, those little triplet books right there are just perfect for that. If you'll read through that, you'll read the fruit of the Spirit. You'll read about how to be filled with the Spirit. This is how God intends for us to live. It's what Watchman Nee, the the, uh, old uh, Chinese uh, theologian, called the normal Christian life. He believed that the normal Christian life should be the spirit-filled life. But what happens is so few believers are actually spirit-filled that the, that the normal becomes abnormal and the, what should be abnormal becomes normal. And so there are gatherings like this of believers where no one's seeing any miracles. No one hears the voice of God. Nothing ever changes. It's, it's just the work of humanity trying to do God's work, and we cannot do God's work. One of the greatest things that ever set me free as a pastor was when I realized I'm not really responsible for you. It was a wonderful moment, just so you know. (laughs) God's responsible for you. I'm just responsible to be faithful to what he asked me to do. So I don't build the church. Remember Matthew 16? Jesus said, I will build my church. He's responsible for you. He's responsible for the church. Whether or not the Holy Spirit shows up, that's the work of God. I'm responsible to be faithful, to walk full of the Spirit. He does all the other stuff because you're not really the one who casts out demons. God's the one who does that work. So we've got this group, and they represent, and every one of you know these folks. Maybe you are these folks. They represent believers. You're saved. You know you've given your life to the Lord, but you are not experiencing the ongoing fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit of God. That's what the eight disciples represent. Now, there's a whole bunch of other people there at the bottom of the mountain, and the Father is going to be the representative of just the mob, all right? And uh, he represents people who don't know the Lord. And I'm not going to talk about this. really a fourth group at the bottom of the mountain. And they don't know the Lord and they don't want to know the Lord. I'm not going to talk about them today. The Father represents people who don't know the Lord, but his heart is ready. So uh, when you're sharing your faith, this is one of the things that you've got to learn to discern. And, it, and some believers don't ever figure it out. So they just blunder in there with the Roman road and punch people in the nose and hit them over the head with the Bible. And then later we find out that was not very effective. Um, so one of the things you've got to be discerning about is what is God doing in the heart of the person that you're talking to? Some hearts are hard. You've got to take a different approach with that guy, with that gal. Some hearts are ready. So that's what you're discerning. This guy is ready. God has done a preparation, a preparatory work in his heart, and he has used his son to do that work. I don't know anything about this guy before this event right here that appears in Mark 9 and Matthew 17. I don't know if he was prideful. I don't know if he was hard. I don't know if he said he didn't have time for religion. I don't know if he preferred to watch the gladiators on TV on Sundays and didn't go to church. Uh, I don't know if he really just took pride in his chariot and he washed it and waxed it every Sunday. I don't know why he didn't go to church. I don't know anything about who he was. But God begins to soften his heart. And, And once again, God's the one who does this work. You don't have to soften a heart. Can I go so far as to say, you can't soften a heart? Some of you have tried, haven't you? You can't soften a heart. Only God can do that. But God uses his son. Oh, how fathers, how we love our sons. He uses his son. And he, he, wants, his, he wants his son to play football at the University of Jerusalem. He wants his son to go marry a pretty Jewish girl. He wants to have grandchildren. He wants to see his son successful. And his son's got this demon, and it breaks his heart. And God uses all kinds of things. Every one of us, if we stopped right now and we started to tell our journey, there's a moment in time and a place where you began to be open 
to the Holy Spirit of God. And some of you know exactly where it was. Some of you, you would just say, well, kind of softened and I softened and I softened. And you just kind of grew that way. I was saved when I was a boy, so it wasn't as much that was hard. That's, that's the great thing about children being saved is they're not as hard as adults. It's better. But some of you, you already hardened that hard up pretty good. The world's tough. It's a mean place. You got hard yourself. And God had to do that softening work. And some of you know that it took something big in your life. It was a visit to the ER. It was the doctor saying this. And it might have not been about you. It might have been about your kids. It might have been when you realized, ah, I should have had them in church. I should have said this. I want, whatever it was, God did something. Sometimes for some people, it's a, it's a financial uh, catastrophe. Some people, it's a health catastrophe. With this man, it was his son. And now he has heard that Jesus is at Mount Hermon. Uh, by the way, it's probably nighttime, just so you have a sense of it. It's at least dusk. It's, he's, so it's not the middle of the day. He's, maybe he's traveled all day. He's found where Jesus is supposed to be. And to his, to his great disappointment, Jesus isn't there. So here's the disciples, and he's like, okay, I'm here, and I've heard these guys, you know, they've been with Jesus, and so then they start to try to cast out the demon and nothing. Now, can you imagine if Jesus came down and now the disciples have tried, and Jesus says, do you want me to cast out the demon? And he said, no, I've tried that before, it doesn't work. Could have, but he doesn't. Because the Holy Spirit of God has softened his heart and he's at this place and you, do you hear how soft it is? Lord, if you can do anything, would you have compassion on us? I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak about this word, compassion, on Sunday for those of you who are watching online last Sunday. And it's not, uh, it's not the word agape. It's the word splinkdomidzai. That's a little something for you. Just use that later in the day just to impress somebody. Um, the only thing we have in English, uh, English word is splanktology. Splanktology is a study of the visceral parts. It's your, it's your bowels. And in the ancient Jewish mindset, this is where love came from. You felt love here. So we, in Western civilization, we... We love comes from the heart. It's still just an organ in there, right? So whether, and then some, some civilizations, they say with the liver, I love you with all my liver. <laughs> Doesn't quite have the same. Imagine all the Valentine's cards being the shape of a liver. <laughs> so the point is that it's, the point is it's from the deepest part of the inside of you. Lord, if you can do anything, have compassion on us. And the Lord says, if, bring him here. Anything's possible for those who believe. And so this is not just the boy being, the demon being cast out of the boy. I believe this is the father's salvation. You're reading his salvation experience. I, I, I have heard people say that their salvation prayer went like this. God, if you're truly up there, I'm, 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 I'll give you my life. Now, that doesn't sound like a very strong prayer for salvation, does it? But the Bible says that what God seeks is a broken and a contrite heart. He wants it from the deepest part of you where you say, maybe, maybe not even with all the faith that you should have, I believe, I, it's not very much, help my unbelief, but here's my life, and that's what this father does. Here's what I've got. It's not very much, Lord. I got a tiny little bit of faith. I mostly have a lot of unbelief. Here's my belief. Help my unbelief. And he literally gives himself away. And that's one of the people at the bottom of the mountain. We can get frustrated. Jesus certainly did with the other believers who are unbelieving. But with this group, man, you should be ready. When you discern 
in your heart that you are with somebody that God's starting to open their heart and soften their heart and they're ready to receive Jesus, then all your other appointments the rest of the day are canceled. This is where you're supposed to be. This is the time. Now you give yourself to that person. And the, and the Christian life in many ways is going through life looking for this person. You're looking for the person that's ready. And sometimes you find them in very strange places, and sometimes you find them at inconvenient times. But they are ready. If you'll just stop, they will give their lives to the Lord. I believe we walk by people like this all the time. And so that is one group at the bottom of the mountain. The boy represents a third group at the bottom of the mountain. This boy has got big, big problems and he, re- he represents the people of the world that are, and I'm just going to kind of lump them all together, who are, are truly, he's demon-possessed, so he, he represents those who are under the influence of Satan. Uh, there's two ways that we talk about that in theology. We talk about people that are possessed, and that is truly an indwelling of a demon, like, we, like you and I have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and I don't have time to teach it, but if you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the demon can't dwell there too. So a true Christian can never be possessed by a demon. The, the holy and the unholy, they, they don't go together. That doesn't work. But we can also be oppressed by demons. It's one thing to be possessed, possessed, inside out, but, but Satan attacks you from the outside in. He, he can't possess you, but he certainly wants to oppress you. And so we take both of these categories together, and there are a whole bunch of people, and they think of people that fall in this category, people that are just alcoholic, people that are drug addicted, people that are porn and sex addicted, addiction of any kind, Gambling, uh, spending of money, food. You can, you can, there's so many addictions. There's so many ways that we can lose our way, become completely confused. The food can be the eating too much of it and the gluttony. It can, it can be uh, uh, anorexia going the other way. You, you, can, you don't see life clearly. You don't see yourself for who you are. You don't see the truth. How can a person who doesn't eat, doesn't eat, they're bulimic or anorexic, they're down to 100 pounds, they're down to 90 pounds, they look in the mirror and they see themselves as fat. That's because they don't see truth. So that is a, that's a satanic delusion and some mental illness falls into this as well. There are people who are perfectly healthy they don't drink too much. They don't gamble too much. They're not addicted to porn, but they drank all the Kool-Aid. They, they literally do not see the truth in the world. And, and now in America, these people are a lot of people. There are a lot of people, they do not see where we are. They do not see that as a nation, we are in big trouble. They think we're really good. As a matter of fact, they actually think things are about to get better. So... We, we live at the bottom of the mountain where we are dealing with all kinds of people who are influenced by, blinded. The Bible uses this a lot, this, this metaphor a lot. Blinded by Satan and they cannot see the truth. Now, if you can't see the truth, what do you need? Do, do, do you, follow my thinking here, it's important. Do you need Rehab? Do you need a warm glass of milk? Do you need a cup of coffee? It's okay to do that in the name of Christ. It's really good to meet needs in the name of Christ. But what they really need is Jesus. They need for the lies to be gone, the possessor, the chains of, of, uh, of addiction to be broken so that now with the clear head, they can hear the truth and the truth can set them free. The Bible speaks, Jesus speaks, of occasion where the Pharisees cast out demons, and but the person the the person lost the demon, but they never gave their life to Christ. And then Jesus tells the story of the demon. And he says the demon wanders around looking for a place to live. And he goes all around, he doesn't really find a better place. And when he comes back, he finds the house. This is what Jesus says about the the mind and the body. It's swept and clean now because the demon's been gone. And so the demon moves back in. So 
exercising the demon is only half the problem. When you, when you help people with their addictions, that's only half the problem. You can overcome alcohol and still die and go to hell sober. Then you need Jesus. Jesus is the other answer to the problem. And so this boy represents those people that we work with who are blinded by Satan, troubled by, by demons, whether possessed or oppressed, who are addicted, uh, can't see the truth, and that involves much more. And Jesus says about that here at the end, the disciples are like, this was a hard one. How come we couldn't do it? He says, this takes prayer. You gotta walk with Jesus. You gotta, you gotta spend some time in prayer. You just don't show up Snap your fingers, cast out demons, and everything's hunky-dory. This is a different kind of work. Now, living at the bottom of the mountain is exhausting. You're living with believers who aren't filled with the Spirit. You're living with unbelievers who are ready to be saved. You need to take time for them. You're living with people who are under the influence of Satan. And you are, Jesus is right there, Roll up the sleeves, do the battle, help the disciples, save the dad, cast out the demon, raise the boy, do the work, teach the disciples. It's exhausting. So if you do that every day, every day, every day, and there is no mountaintop experience in your life, you'll get more and more and more tired. And you, and you won't feel the Lord. You, you, one day you'll go like, I went to church, but yeah, pastor wasn't very good today. Songs didn't really speak to me today. I just, just kind of go, I went a couple times going through the motions. I don't think I'll go back. It's not us. It's you. You've got to get alone with Jesus in some isolated, private place, and you've got to hear the voice of God You've got to see his glory and you've got to let him fill your tank back up again so that you have the spiritual energy to go back down to the bottom of the mountain and do the work. That's what I hope Wednesday is for you. uh, Just so you know, Wednesday's that for me. Wednesday's the middle of the week. Fill my spiritual tank back up again. I get to be with you, we get like-mindedness, we open God's word, we bless each other. Okay, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I'll see you Sunday. That's what you gotta have. If you're going too long, if you're going too long, if the week goes to months and the months go to a quarter and a quarter goes to a year and you don't hear the voice of God, you don't see the glory of God, stop, cancel your appointments, get out your Bible, get alone and turn to God. And the scripture says, if you seek me, you will find me. He's waiting for you.